So some bastard's approach to knee replacement has gotten a lot of publicity of late. You know, everybody wants a major surgery like knee replacement, but they don't want to go through the surgery itself, right? Surgery is soft tissue damage, muscle damage. Obviously there's recovery and swelling. Look, it's a major procedure. Now the truth of it is knee replacement in any of its forms. Knee replacement is the only cure for arthritis. When you have arthritis, you're bone on bone. There's no way to regrow new cartilage. So knee replacement is the only cure. Traditional knee replacement is done using what we call a medial pair patellar approach. So essentially you come up along the patellar tendon around the patella, the kneecap, and you slice gently up into the quad. You tend to split the quad. That's a medial pair patellar approach. The vast majority of knee replacements now in the US and internationally are done splitting that quad muscle. Now you hear a lot of people talk about minimally invasive and, and all kinds of other terms. Many of those terms don't have a true meaning, but I'll tell you what does have a true meaning, subvastus. So in the subvastus approach, instead of like a traditional approach to the knee, right? You still gotta get in there. Instead of a traditional approach to the knee, you come up along the patellar tendon, around the kneecap, which is the patella, but then underneath the vastus medialis, that's the part of the quad that's on the inside. So the quad muscle is four muscles, in a traditional approach, we detach the VMO from the tendon, do all our work. In a subvastus, we take all four of those muscles together and slide them over away from the femur, do all the work and then close it back. The key here is you're not splitting the quad. That means less muscle damage. Hopefully that means less pain, faster recovery, and ultimately a more normal feeling knee. So subvastus knee replacement is truly a minimally invasive. Now, don't let that term confuse you because a lot of terms are confusing. Minimally invasive because it doesn't cut the muscle. So when somebody says they do minimally invasive approach, I, I, I want you to understand exactly uh, what that means. And in subvastus, it means underneath the muscle. So a couple of questions. Um, does it go by other names? Sub V, that's actually what I'll call it, sub V. I think it sounds cool, but it really means subvastus going underneath uh, the muscles, keeping all four quad muscles together. What is the Jiffy Knee and do you do it? So the Jiffy Knee is a registered trademark. It's essentially a brand company. And what that means is that name, that name is trademark. So you can't put that on here or anything like that. I do not do the Jiffy Knee. I've not been trained by the guy who owns the brand name Jiffy Knee, but the Jiffy Knee does describe on their website using a subvastus approach. So it is a minimally invasive approach. Now, the implants they use are different than the ones that I use. I use Stryker Triathlon. I also do my subvastus or minimally invasive knee. I do my subvastus approach with robotics. And I think that's really, really important. The Jiffy Knee, as it's currently taught, my understanding is does not use robotics. So I use the Mako platform. I do a CT scan preoperatively, make a custom 3D model of the knee. I actually use a robotic arm during surgery for precision of cuts. So subvastus or sub V is the muscle approach where I come underneath the muscle to protect the muscle. Yes, hopefully that means less therapy afterwards, less pain. So, so you come underneath the quad, that's taking care of the soft tissue, and then robotics cuts the bone with precision. So I think that's really the combination that's gonna win here. We're always making improvements. We're always growing together. You know, adding subvastus to my practice is rel relatively new. The subvastus approach is not a new approach. It was popular maybe 20 years ago, but there were some challenges. It was before robotics came into play. So I think now subvastus plus robotics is really uh, what, what I think is gonna make a great impact. Some other questions here. How do you combine subvastus with robotic surgery? Just ex explain that. Subvastus is cutting, coming underneath the muscle, less therapy, less pain, etc. Great way to do it. Again, I like sub V, <clears throat> but robotics is about precision. We really need to match the knee replacement to the patient. A knee replacement is essentially coating the end of the femur with metal, coating the top of the tibia with metal, putting a plastic piece in between. So instead of bone on bone, it's metal and plastic in between. But how you get there, right? Whether or not you cut the quad, this is what's important. So subvastus is truly a quad sparing knee. You probably heard that term too. What are the real recovery benefits? Well, again, you're not splitting the quad. So when your knee bends, you're not stressing through that tendon that you had to repair, hopefully less swelling. All my patients are up walking the same day. Even when I do a more traditional medial parapetellar approach, there are some times which knees are so stiff you have to do that. But 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 yeah, you, uh, medial parapetellar or subvastus, you get up, you walk the same day. Most people are on a walker less than a week, sometimes only a few days. 
over to a cane, whatever you're comfortable. Physical therapy is really important. And three times a week for six weeks is, is normal, but hopefully with submastis, we'll do less and less. Who qualifies for sub B robotic surgery? Well, most everybody. There are some cases of deformity or stiffness where we'll have to use some special approaches. We'll have to do, actually do more muscle release in order to balance the knee. That's an individual thing, but virtually all my cases now are subvastus and robotic. Why is the approach not standard everywhere? That, now that's a really good question. I mentioned earlier sub-B or sub vastus is not a new approach. There are other people giving it other names like Swift Knee or Jiffy Knee. Uh, these are branded names and I don't do any of those surgeries, but I do do the approach sub vastus. Why isn't everybody doing it? It's technically slightly more difficult talking about the subvastus approach. And, and that means you have to really kind of spend some extra time with it, at least early on, done some specialized training. There's all kinds of training that different companies provide that can provide some specialty training, but it's not impossible. It's certainly not dangerous. There are no real complications with the subvastus that you wouldn't have uh, with a traditional total knee. It's just the benefit to the patient. I get a lot of questions about cost. You know, does a robotic knee cost more than a non-robotic knee. Not for my patients. We do do a CT scan before the surgery, so it's an additional charge to the insurance, but usually patients are gonna hit their deductible and therefore there's no more out of cost, uh, out of pocket. And uh, and by the way, there's, th there's no additional cost for the surgery itself. So uh, how can I find out if it's right for me? Listen, the decision for subvastus versus more traditional knee replacement, e even the deciding whether or not robotics is right for you. I, I use robotics on virtually all my knee replacements. And I think it's a combination of robotics to get the knee balanced and protect the soft tissues with the with the blade that's controlled by the by the arm, but also the subvastus approach, which is truly squat, quad sparing. This is what I'm trying to deliver for patients now. Uh, if you have other questions, there's so much confusion in the market, you know, everybody comes in and some people have a long list of questions and I think that's fine. I, I appreciate people who are doing their own research, but at some point you gotta find a surgeon that you can trust. Do I use PS or cruciate retaining? Well, it's a great question. It depends on many things. I actually am not a one trick pony. I always wanna match it to the patient. So if the patient has a deficient PCL or complex deformity, they're gonna get a posterior stabilized knee for me. But if they have a relatively flexible, healthy knee, the PCL is normal, cruciate retaining can really be a great uh, option for those patients. Um, so it depends. I probably do 60% posterior stabilized now and probably 40% cruciate retaining. I do subvastus total knee, this is in the comments, but can you do the adductor canal block post-op with subvastus? You absolutely can. So for my patients, our anesthesiology team, as far as pain control, around the time of surgery, we do them under spinal, but then they do an adductor canal nerve block with Expirel, and they do an IPAC block uh, with just uh, bupivacaine. So spinal, adductor canal, IPAC block, all done before the surgery, actually. You can do an adductor canal during a subvastus approach, but I, I don't do that. Have the anesthesiologist do it before surgery. When you use PS, are you concerned about the size of the size of the triathlon box on a PS. You know, that, that's an interesting question. And I don't, I don't know where you're coming from. So there are multiple knee systems. Striker Triathlon is the one that I use. They actually just redesigned the femur, the PS femur. It's called PS Pro. And it is designed to have less, a smaller size box for more uh, preservation of bone. So if you do a PS, you got to take away a little bit of the center bone of the femur. We call that the box. In the triathlon, it was pretty much the same size through all sizes. So they've, they've redesigned that femur. It's called the uh, Pro PS. You, you know, honestly, I didn't have a lot of problems with fractures, uh, but obviously anytime you take away bone, you worry about it. Do you encounter VMO wasting with the subvastus approach? Now that's a smart question. Remember how we said subvastus, you go underneath the vastus, underneath the, the VMO and pull it over? The concern would be if you're too aggressive in your retraction that you could damage the muscle, the, the muscle itself, the nerve that's innervating the, the vastus medialis. The nerve's probably far more proximal, so certainly doing a good release is important. It's important to have good surgical technique. There's actually the, the, when the, when the VMA, VMO comes and attaches the patella, there's the muscle, and then there's a really dense tendon, which is strong, and it, it attaches to the kneecap. So. Anytime I use a retractor up against the VMO, 
during surgery, I, be, I wanna be on that tendon portion, not on the muscular portion. So surgical technique is really important. Yes, VMO, we wanna stay under it, but it's also very, very important how you handle those muscle tissues during surgery. So again, don't retract over the muscle, retract, retract over the tendon portion right where it inserts onto the patella. Do you do videos on arthroplasty and infections? Yeah, uh, I do a ton of videos on arthroplasty. Again, my name is Corey Callendine. I am an orthopedic surgeon, but I focus mainly on hip and knee arthritis and specifically hip and knee replacement. There's a ton of information on my page. Infections are a complete disaster. There's no question about that. The incidence in the U.S. is 1% to 2%, which is incredibly high, much lower in my practice uh, as I've dedicated my whole life to try to minimizing that. Uh, but yeah, infections are a disaster. There's some videos, but I'll do more. Have you done a knee replacement on a heart stent patient? Yeah, we unfortunately or fortunately, we do knee replacement and hip replacements on people with cardiac stents. We always coordinate care uh, with the cardiologist. Are you excited for using Mako for revision hips? Yeah, so Mako is a robotic platform. We do a preoperative CT scan, but it's only been used largely in primary. So now there's some really cool add-on features that we can use on the hip, which are cool. So uh, what would cause subpatellar pain post-total knee? Pain around the kneecap is very common. The most common reason for pain around the kneecap after knee replacement is weak quads. Uh, make sure the implants look okay, see your surgeon. Um, okay, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, come hang out. I don't know what that is. Have questions in the comments, let me know. Uh, we'll, we'll clip this up and get the high-end stuff to you later. Y'all have a great night. See you.